Radyosu'nun video röportajlarından ilkinde sizlerle beraberiz. Yanımda Cesilam'ın vasiyeti kitabının yazarı Jane Rogers var. 2012 Arthur C. Clarke ödülü sahibi. Aynı zamanda da 2011 yılında Man Booker ödülü adayı olan kitap Nemesis kitaptan çıktı. Ee, şu anda Özgen Berkol Dağ'ın bilim kurgu kütüphanesindeyiz Jane Rogers'la. Ha, welcome. Thank you. Um, I hope you're finding Turkey great. I'm really, really loving Istanbul. It's my first visit. It's a great city. Okay, great. Um, now, as Turkish readers, we've only been able to uh, read one of your works, Jesse Lem's Testament. And uh, so we know that it, it's, it's got the Arthur C. Clarke Award on 2012. And, and um, apparently it did it with a... With, with Um, with quite a praise, um, Christopher Priest said that you were the only nominee that was worth it. <laughs> He said very rude things about <laughs> the others, actually. <laughs> yes, it was rude. <laughs> uh, that that's actually the only sentence I could find. Exactly, there. it is. So your only science fiction work has been uh, has the one of the most prestigious science fiction awards in the world. But where do you put uh, Jesse Lamb's testament uh, among your works? Um, yeah, my favourite of my novels is, is, is the one called Island. Um, and like Jessie Lamb, actually, it has a first-person female narrator, a young, a young woman, a very, very disturbed young woman, um, whereas Jessie, in my opinion, is quite sane. Um, <laughs> but uh, I, like, I like Island very much because... I think it's partly because I really, really loved the place that it was set. It's set on um, an island off Scotland, um, one of the... Um, Uh, Scottish Hebrides and it's an incredibly beautiful setting and the setting is integral to the book so I think my love of the place fed into the book and that's one of the reasons why it remains my favourite but Jessie Lamb um, didn't start a science fiction I mean I didn't I didn't intend to write science fiction when I started this book um, how, how, how did it came to being like you were Um, one day you woke up and go like, oh, what if they all died? Let me just write that. How no, did it all? Not at all. No, it mean? started um, it, in my other books. I've always been quite interested in exploring relationships between parents and children from different aspects, either from the parent or from the child's point of view. And one of the one of the things I was interested in with um, it, when I st very much started to in the in the early days of thinking about this book. I was particularly interested in the moment when a child, um, in their teenage years, makes their first rebellion against their parents and asserts themselves, you know, I'm an adult like you, I've grown up. Because it's, it's, a, it's a very interesting moment, because the parent has, until that point, spent their time protecting and encouraging and helping the child into the world. But at that point, the child stands up and says, you know, I don't need you, I don't want you, I can think for myself. And that's very traumatic for the parent, often. Um, often the rebellion in real life is very small. You know, yeah. I, might, I might go and drink some alcohol when I'm 15. Okay, that might be my little rebellion. But sometimes the rebellion can be very big and can be extremely threatening to the parents. And that's what I was interested in. I was interested in that moment where you see a child become an adult and take on the world and what the parents' reaction to that would be. So this started as a book with three voices daughter, mother and father, all three had their voices in it, set in the present and the girl was going to become a suicide bomber. Okay. <laughs> no, uh, that's, so so that's... That, was, that was the first um, thinking of it. But what I was interested in doing was making it a situation where the reader would not know who to sympathise with, so that the reader would be as torn as the characters yeah. are. And therefore, you have to find something that the child wants to do which the reader doesn't prejudge the reader doesn't know in advance if it's good or bad now a suicide bomber is pretty much bad so that was no good and then I started thinking about the political causes, the things that a person might want to sacrifice their life for and in the present they all come with political um, agendas so that the readers know uh, What, they, what their position is. You know, I don't approve of such and such a kind of behavior. But if you push it into the future and you make the person put their life on the line for something that nobody knows about, that nobody has a position on, then you can be free 
to try and engage the reader's sympathies on both sides. And that's why I had to move it into the future. I was very reluctant to set it in the future because I thought, it's, how can I be convinced that it's going to be very difficult? Um, but on the other hand, I needed to find something where my, where my protagonist would want to give up her life for something that the reader could both admire and yet think was perhaps was foolish. And I, in fact, that's the thing that I'm very pleased about because readers are very divided on this oh, book. Very, yeah, very divided. Then I am. <laughs> Good. Um, so um, you said it was a tough decision to uh, m m this make the setting in the future. Yeah. And um, one of the common things in reviews and one of the things that I really found very strong about it was that it's, it's not... Um, it's not so to say a distant future with its own rules and stuff. It's like tomorrow. Yeah. Uh, it there could be a news that say, okay, we have this disease, so exactly. we don't know, and it's it kind of adds to the tension. Um, so my question from that would be, um, while writing the the, the book, um, did you? Did you know how um, how tense you wanted it to be? Yes, I want. I mean, I wanted it to be a real. Uh, well, obviously, somebody's going to die. Um, I mean, a lot of people die. In <laughs> fact, in this book, many people die. <laughs> but uh, you know, my, the, I wanted it. I mean, I wanted that combination, which I love in science fiction, actually, of a big idea, but a very domestic, real world. So, I mean, for example, one of the science fiction writers I love the best is John Wyndham. And if you take a book like The Chrysalids, it's a huge idea. You know, people become telepathic. A new <laughs> generation um, is totally different than the previous generation. But, you know, the detail is all about, you know, how do we, you know, where do we get food and how do we manage? And the, the lives are completely, genuinely drawn. And that's, I wanted her, I wanted Jessie to have a very ordinary domestic life. She's an ordinary kid. She's the girl next door. She goes to school. She has her friend. She wants a boyfriend. You know, she fights with her mum and dad. She's normal. But then this massive thing happens to her, and she rises to the occasion. So, uh, Jessie Lamb raises a lot of questions about um, ethics of science, about family ties, about sure. religion. Mm. And, um, well, some readers seem to think that not some readers seem to think that, but uh, r some readers um, think most of these questions are unanswered. And In the book? Yeah. Okay. And it's, um, it's, it, you, it's kind of like you're, you're willingly not trying to answer any of them so that they don't become the point. But um, So w what, what do you think about... Uh, leaving those questions unanswered about all the activism in the book and uh, all the questions about religion and all the questions about ethics and um, do you enjoy that? Do you enjoy not uh, giving answers about that? It's not, I don't set out to not give answers but it's partly about, you know, what, 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 what is it that matters in this story to me and what matters in the story is the the relationship between the girl and her parents, which is not just the relationship between one individual girl and her individual parents, but what, it, but, what, but what is the thing that happens as one generation takes over from the next, as the older generation gets pushed off the stage and the new generation comes on and says, this is how it is, you're irrelevant now, your life is over, you're finished. I've got to do the new thing, whatever it is. So that was, the, that was the line I was interested in pursuing. And, I mean, it's quite interesting. This was a book that was rejected by a number of publishers, including my own publisher. And what he said when he read it was, why don't you tell us who... Um, why don't you explore the story about the biological terrorism? Why do you just start this amazing story with an act of biological terrorism and never explore who did it or why they did it or how they caught them or... And I was like, well, I'm not interested in that story. That's not the story I wanted to write. Do you know that story, though? Well, I know, I know as much of it as I need to know, which is that it happened, and therefore people's lives were affected. I mean, it's, it's a plot mechanism. It's a way of starting off the specific story I wanted to tell, which was a different story, not that one. Um, so about those questions I mentioned, 
Um, I I actually have a quote from uh, Maureen Freely, okay. as we talked before, and yeah. um, that that's a name that re uh, resonates with Turkish readers a lot. And although the comments are on Mr. Rose Virgins, mm. uh, I had a question about those. And I um, should say, actually, she reviewed Mr. Rose Virgins before I met her. <laughs> oh. It's not a friend reviewing <laughs> my work. That was a book was published a long time it makes ago. It all the more interesting now then. Um, so she says, Jane Rogers has always been an interesting writer. Her novels are accessible, or would be, if the reading public knew about them. But she says that on 90s, so... Mm -hmm. Uh, if you haven't heard of her, it's because she is hard to market. She is not a feminist or anti-feminist. She doesn't uh, play the game at London literary parties. She sits at home with her husband and two children in Lancashire and <laughs> writes books. Yet the fact is that she writes better than almost anyone of her generation. So there's this uh, there's this sentence here that says she is. Uh, she's not a feminist or anti-feminist and that was what I found in this book as well because you gave us all these things about some people were saying it's all about animal cruelty some people mm -hmm. were saying it's it's all about religion and you gave us all that yes. and there was all these youth activism about all that but you never really gave us which do you, which one would you be in favor of the whole point about all those different splinter groups um, and the uh, the flame, the women, the women, the uh, very angry group of women who, who regarded the whole thing as a plot by men against women. The whole point about all those splinter groups was that Jessie dipped her toe in the water with each one. She she looked into it. She even tried to join it, but she couldn't see that it would be a solution. She couldn't see that it would fix things, and so. All she could find was that her own personal action could be a solution. And that, you know, I'm not, I'm not writing a book to tell anybody what to do or to give a message. I'm not interested in that. I'm interested in exploring things. And so what I was interested in was taking her through the um, attempt to find a way to effectively act in the world and she couldn't find any way in the, in, the, in, the, in, in, the, in the avenues that all these groups were offering so she had to find her own way now that's, that's not me saying you know you should all do this that's not me saying these groups are rubbish that's me just saying this character in this situation had to plough her own furrow and find her own way does that answer the question? Yeah, it 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 does. It yeah. does not uh, not as the viewers would like it. Like so, who who does she support? Kind of question, but it does support, um, It does answer my question about your motives. But but also, I mean, people don't read a book to be told what a writer supports. People read a book, you know, to to enter into the lives of the characters and to vicariously live that life and to experience mm. that imaginatively. I mean, I hate books that tell me what to say. <laughs> um. So, about the structure of books, you are also a lecturer on writing fiction, and uh, as we talked before, um, our readers, we would love uh, questions about these. You write novels, you write radio plays, you give lectures, you do jury work on literary prizes. How do you manage all that? Um... Well, just like anyone else <laughs> doing a job. <laughs> I mean, I, that's, uh, you know, it's just, that's what I do. That's my work. So, I mean, I teach one afternoon a week and I write most mornings. And, you know, I divide up my time. It's, it's very prosaic. It's not, <laughs> there's no mystery to it. <laughs> uh, so, my follow-up question would be, how do you work, though? How, like, do you have a system? Uh, are you organized in any sort of way or just go with the flow um, when I start a book, it's, um, I mean, and you can see from the example I gave you of starting this book, it often changes a great deal from concept to final, um, to final, uh, draft. Um, so, I mean, I'll have a sense of what I want to write about, and quite often I'll spend quite a long time writing about that, writing around it, not writing chronologically, but writing bits, maybe if there are different characters' voices 
for example, this book started with the, the mother, the father, and, the, and Jesse, and now it's only Jesse. So I wrote a bit of each one's voice, and in fact I wrote about 40,000 words of the father's voice, because I liked him, he's a good character, I was interested in him. Um, and so there's a lot of just writing, 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 and then uh, there comes a certain point where I think, okay, I've got to get a grip on this, I've got to structure it in some way, and think about how it's actually going to hang together as a, as a whole book in the end. Um, and what happened with the father's voice there, although I was fond of it, um, what I realised was that if, the, if you just get Jesse's voice, but you get the reported dialogue of the parents, because most people's sympathies are, tend to be on the parents' side, you know what the parents are feeling. Um, and just from giving descriptions of small actions or small things they say, you can figure out what's going on with them. Whereas with her, you don't know what's going on with her. So I thought, OK, it's going to be much more dramatic if I just focus it on her. And we'll leave the parent's story to emerge for the reader. And, the re and, and also that'll make the book shorter and sharper and stronger. It'll be more dramatic. But, I mean, I think, you know, some, a, a really brilliant organised writer would have done all that process first <laughs> <laughs> and then just written Jesse's voice. <laughs> but I've always needed to write a lot and then cut a lot, write a lot and then revise a lot. I mean, it took me five years to write this book. Just, I mean, not full-time, obviously, but it takes that span of time. They've all taken four, four or five years. It takes that span of time to be objective about it, to cut it, to shape it, which I do after I've done a lot of the writing. Was there anything different about writing um, science fiction? Well, it, uh, yeah, that's an interesting question, really, because um, I've written I've written historical fiction as well. I've written fiction which is set in the early nineteenth century and in the eighteenth century, um, and both and doing historical fiction involves a lot of research, and setting something in the future also involves a lot of research. So I did a lot of reading of. Uh, you know, writers who write about future scenarios, I did quite a lot of science research. Obviously, um, kind of research into um, in vitro fertilization and all the uh, scientific information that comes out in the book. Um, and I, I mean, I would say that probably the amount of research that I had to do for setting something in the future was similar to the research I had to do for setting something in the past. So it, it's it's not, not harder, but... It, but I felt that there were there were areas that where I needed to be more knowledgeable than I was when I started writing the book. Before you started writing, who were your favorite authors as a child or as a teen? Oh, that's difficult. They change a lot. I mean, I read a lot, and quite often, you know, the last book I read is my favorite for a while. It's, <laughs> it changes a lot. Um, I mean, I think. Uh, as a child, I just read everything I could get my hands on. Um, I was just, you know, omnivorous, and I'm not sure I particularly had favourites. I just liked everything that I could get. There's a British children's author called Enie Blyton, who's actually, I wouldn't recommend to anybody, but I love them. I read them. <laughs> you didn't recommend them, but you no, love them. Uh, but I love them, yes. <laughs> um, but, yeah, when I was in my teens, I guess I was reading, um, you know, reading the classics, reading, you know, authors like um, George Eliot or Charlotte Bronte, um, you know, re reading, reading classic English writers. My favourite writers now, um, one of my favourite writers is Philip Roth, and American Pastoral is one of my favourite novels of all time, and there... It, it, that did actually feed into me wanting to write Jesse Lamb because in American Pastoral um, the hero's daughter commits an outrage, she, she uh, plants a bomb and someone's killed and you never ever hear the story from her side so you never know why she's done it and you never, you only hear the father's side of the story um, which is of pain and bewilderment and terrible loss and I was, I was very interested in looking at the young person side of the story. So although obviously the setting is completely different, the idea of a daughter who will do something which is abhorrent to her father, um, and that puts her at risk, and that, is, um, that, was, that, that sort of came, I think, out of, out of American pastoral. 
And I often find that books that I really love um, inform what I'm writing. Do you know um, Kazuo Ishiguro's book, Never Let Me Go? Uh, yes, 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 yes. I mean, that's yeah. a, you see, that's a really brilliant novel, which is science fiction, because it is in the future, although it is very everyday yes. life. But actually, you know, the heroine is cloned. So, and that's, I mean, that's the sort of book I really love. Yes. That's one of my favourite books. And actually, Je- um, Jesse Lem's Testament is more like No Let Me Go than, let's say, Children of Men. Yes. Which is, you know, which has quite a similar setting, but as you pointed out, um, doesn't really go into an ordinary life as no. you would do that. No. Um, uh, about that uh, suicide bombing, Yes. Uh, idea. But at which point did you did you um, cross that out? Because while reading the book, after you said that, said that of course, um, there was a reference to suicide bombing. Yes. There were references to Guy Fox and these um, these kids' uh, activism mm-hmm. could actually lead to something like that, mm-hmm. and perhaps the audience even could still, um, you know, resonate with it. So, at which point did you say, no, I'm not going to do that? Um, I already started writing. I'd started writing, but I mean, where I started was in the family and the family relationships, and her being quite young and childish and not, uh, you know, not um, not imagining doing anything against her parents' wishes. So the work that I'd done really was on developing character um, rather than working on the plot. And, I mean, it it changed hugely, and also my decision about where to break into the story changed, because, obviously, I needed to explain the situation about the biological terrorism, but I wanted to get onto her story as quickly as possible. And there's actually a a problem there, because you you have to have the act of biological terrorism and for it to run for a while, so that it becomes serious and everyone realizes there's no fix for it so that then you can become interested in what she's going to do to fix it. It can't be act of biological terrorism. Oh, tomorrow I'm going to sacrifice <laughs> myself. It's not, that's not going to work. So but just that thing of you know, how, how to deal with the timing was... Um, I beat my head against that for a while. Um, okay, last questions here. Um, what would you suggest uh, young and um, aspiring writers to do? Read. Just read. I mean, that's, you know, that's what I tell the writers that I teach. Because the more you read, it feeds into what you're doing. And the more that you read, uh, you know, with awareness, thinking, you know, how have they made the characters so good? How have they made it so that I can't, you know, can't close it? I can't have to stay up all night and read it. What, you know, what is it? What's making this book really work? Because the more you read and the more you ask those questions, it just feeds into your own practice. Um, thank you so much for this interview. Well, thank you for your questions. It was great to have you here and hope you have, uh, I think you're here for one more day, yeah. right? Hope yeah. you have another nice day.